Well, welcome everybody. This is Karen Perry from NTIA, and um, we're really happy you're here for our funding program as part of the Arizona Broadband Workshop Series. I'd just like to introduce the people who you can see on screen right now before we kick off our program. Um, Jeff Sabaka is going to kick off the program. As I said, I am Karen Perry from NTIA, and um, I'd first like to introduce um, Scott Woods. Scott? Thank you, Karen. Good morning, everyone. Scott Woods here with NTIA. Um, my pleasure to be here with you today. As you all know, uh, Senior Broadband Programs uh, Associate here at NTIA, and I lead our Broadband USA Technical Assistance Program. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here with you again on today. So thank you very much. And Jeff, would you um, lead and take and introduce the um, Arizona team? Sure. Um, this is Jeff Sabak. I'm the state broadband director, uh, as many of you know. Uh, and I'll go ahead and, and pass it over to Shimei Shaheem. Uh, Shimei is our uh, person who keeps this thing running uh, smooth as clockwork uh, and her team. Um, actually, we've got Kyle Holman uh, and Nathan Christensen. Nathan's the guy behind the scenes, literally making sure everything uh, runs on time. So uh, we've got a great team here from the ACA, and we're excited to work with our federal partners to talk about a subject that's uh, important to everybody here, uh, money. And Tim, would you introduce the USDA team? Oh, yeah, good morning. Uh, my name is Tim O'Connell with USDA Rural Development. I'm uh, with the Innovation Center based in Portland, Oregon. And um, presenting today with uh, John Holman, the general field representative uh, based in the Pacific Northwest, but covering for Brian Smith today. And John, let's say hello. Well, thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of USDA, thank you to the Arizona Washington Broadband Office for having a USDA as part of this conversation. I am located in Portland, Oregon, covering for Arizona. It is about 90 degrees in Portland today, so not only am I presenting for Arizona, it feels like I'm in Arizona when I step outside. So thank you very much, everybody. And um, Cindy for EDA. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Cindy Patak. I am with the Economic Development Administration here in the state of Arizona, and I'm representing or work out of the Seattle Regional Office. So good morning, welcome, glad to be here. And Ryan Palmer from the Federal Communications Commission. Good morning. Thank you all for having me. It's uh, great to be a part of this. My name is Ryan Palmer. I'm the chief of the Telecommunications Access Policy Division, otherwise known as TAPD or TAPD at the FCC. And it's our mission in TAPD to advance the goals of universal service that all Americans have access to robust, affordable broadband and voice services. And we do this through our traditional USF programs, which we'll talk about some here today, as well as some of our new exciting appropriated programs. Thank you for having me. And Shimei was introduced, but um, didn't really get to say hello. Shimei, did you want to add a couple words here? Thank you, Karen. Yes, I just wanted to say excited to be here. A lot of really good information coming down the pipeline. Um, so hold on to your seats. All right. Um, now we're going to pull up the slides and hand it over to Jeff Sabaka to start the program. We're all very happy that you're here. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, I, I, I can't stress enough how uh, excited we are at this time to talk specifically about this subject. As many of you know, in the rural communities, um, funding has always been, uh, if not the issue, one of the two or three biggest issues in terms of getting broadband development done. Um, Arizona is a unique state in that 81% of the land is owned by the government. So uh, building from one section of the state to the other is incredibly expensive and, and time consuming. Uh, that has killed many, many opportunities over the years. Uh, we're in a new time now um, through the foresight of our, our elected officials in, in Washington, DC. Uh, there are several great funding packages that you're gonna hear about today from our federal partners. Um, I can't stress enough how important this is, but remember that not every package is for, for every community or every carrier. Um, they are very uh, tailored to different programs, but there's a lot of them. We've never seen this kind of money uh, flood into the, into the system. Uh, this is very similar to uh, some of the big societal shifts we've had over the past with, with different technologies in terms of transportation, uh, with our highway system, uh, electricity with our electric grid. Uh, and we believe that this is a chance for Arizona to really leapfrog uh, other states uh, and, and, and other parts of the country right now 
uh, with this. So I'm excited to uh, have our partners from NTIA talk a little bit about what they're doing, uh, the dollar amounts that, that this little agency that could, that, that's putting together packages for is incredible. Um, these folks work incredibly hard. It's a small agency that's been given an enormous amount of responsibility that I know that I and everyone at DACA have a lot of respect for. Uh, and we're excited to partner with them on this webinar series. Uh, this is one of the main funders of broadband, if not the main funder of broadband uh, in 2021 and heading into 2022. Uh, we've got other agencies on the call, the FCC, the USDA, um, uh, the EDA, that have very uh, large programs as well, but a little bit more targeted. So please take lots of notes, pay attention, uh, and let's get together and talk about these programs after the fact. Uh, we've got some exciting stuff going on right now with the, the NTIA putting out their $288 million grant, which I know we'll hear about here uh, in the state of Arizona, excited. And our state of Arizona grant, our little RBDG that was $3 million a couple years ago. Uh, right now, it's before the legislature, which unfortunately has not come up with a final budget. I will tell you that the figures that they are kicking around are a lot more than $3 million. And that's something that we can do here at the state in addition to everything that you're gonna hear about today. So let me go ahead and pass this back to Karen Archer Perry with NTIA. Uh, and let's hear a little bit about what's going on with our federal partners. Thank you, Jeff, you'll pass it to me. This oh, I'm is, sorry, uh, Scott. No, no worries. We're one in the same. <laughs> uh, so again, good morning and thank you everyone for, for being here today. Uh, I'm gonna take a little bit of time and, and talk about the various resources uh, that we have here at NTIA, namely our three grant programs uh, that we are launching this year, uh, which by preliminary estimation directly impacts uh, stakeholders and communities in Arizona. Next slide, please. Uh, the first slide is just a brief uh, quote from President Joe Biden that really talks about uh, the importance of infrastructure and uh, the role that broadband plays in that. Uh, again, the goal with broadband infrastructure is no matter where you work, no matter where you live, no matter where you are, no matter where your zip code, uh, you have access to uh, the digital economy and therefore the American dream. So next slide, please. And so our commitment at NTIA is, is really four pillars, right? We're going to deploy broadband infrastructure to communities with the greatest need. And you'll, you'll see that in the grant programs that we are uh, launching this year. Uh, but we're gonna support job creation and workforce development uh, by ensuring that all Americans have broadband, have the devices and the digital skills. So in addition to the infrastructure, uh, the physical infrastructure that we're going to support, uh, but we're all gonna support people, the, the physical capital, the, the actual devices and skills that uh, Americans need to be successful uh, and competitive here in the global economy. Uh, and then we're gonna co collaborate with states. Like this is a perfect example working with uh, the Arizona Department of Commerce. Uh, uh, it's a perfect example of how we're going to continue to collaborate with our state partners to leverage resources, both funding resources, planning resources, and assistance. Uh, we're gonna work with tribes, we're gonna work with our industry partners and with our sister federal agencies to effectively expand broadband access and digital inclusion. And then as you've seen with the previous presenta presentations, uh, we, we're leading in the, the curve, if you will, by using data to inform policies and investments uh, for broadband at all levels of government. So you're gonna talk about that. I'm gonna talk about that here in a second. Next slide, please. So first, let me frame the issue. I don't have to tell you about this for Arizona. You all know this, but you know, millions of, of Americans don't have reliable access to broadband. Uh, according to the FCC's 2021 broadband deployment report, you know, 17 million Americans don't have basic broadband at a 25-3 level. It's 25 megabits download, three megabits upload. Um, there are other studies that have been conducted. Pew Research Center, uh, Microsoft just came out with a study, uh, as well as the researchers at Broadband Now that estimate that number is even higher than 17 million Americans. It could be even exceeding 30 million plus Americans. Uh, but again, we know that the roughly 21% of tribal lands and 17% of rural areas don't have access at that FCC benchmark of broadband of 25.3. Uh, 
And then we also know while there are 95.6% of households that have access to 25.3, only around 69% of households subscribe to that service at that level or above. Um, so again, even though there's access, even though there's availability, um, there's still an uh, issue of adoption and utilization of the facilities and infrastructure and services that are available. And so what you see here, um, this is a visualization that was created by our national broadband availability map. And, and the red areas indicate where uh, wireline broadband service is unavailable at the basic FCC benchmark speed of 25.3. And this is based on the FCC's Form 7.7 data, uh, that's carrier reported data. But if you can see, even for Arizona, uh, there are a lot of red areas in Arizona, uh, again, that aren't covered by that 25.3 benchmark. Next slide, please. And as I stated previously, you know, even though we're talking about infrastructure and, uh, and, and access, broadband adoption is even uneven across uh, uh, communities. We know that 65 million Americans don't use the internet at all. 10 million internet users rely solely on a mobile or cellular data plan. Uh, and then 5 million households that are not online identify cost or affordability uh, as their main reason for not using the internet. Uh, and through surveys and, and, and uh, other methods, we know that underconnected Americans uh, tend to be disproportionately low income, non-white, rural, tribes, older Americans, and differently abled Americans. Um, so again, if you just think back over the last year in the pandemic, <clears throat> you know, those uh, school systems, those businesses, those households that could really transform into a digital platform, whether it be for school, for our children, uh, for college, if you're a higher education student, or just a routine business, a restaurant, uh, a store that will be able to sell goods and services on a digital platform. Uh, as we were not able to have people in stores, you know, think about how uneven that distribution is if you don't have access to broadband. So what we see here on this next visualization on this slide, you know, the red area areas indicate places where more than 35% of the households have no internet at all. And this is based on the American Community Survey uh, subscription data. We did a highlight about the ACS data set and the reliability of that data set in our uh, previous uh, webinar presentations. But as you can see here, again, highlighted in that sort of around the Arizona area, uh, there are significant areas in red and orange. Um, there are high concentrations of households that have no access to internet. <clears throat> Next slide, please. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so in other words, we, we know it's time to invest in the American workforce. Uh, based on the surveys that we've conducted and uh, surveys of our partners, you know, 77% of all jobs now require some type of technological skill, uh, some technological or digital skill. You know, 48% of hiring managers say current candidates that they see lack the skills needed to fill open jobs. 29% you know, of students without basic digital skills say they won't even consider post-secondary uh, studies. And then we also know that 12 million households lack access to devices, computers, the tablets, or smartphones, again, to be able to effectuate and utilize uh, infrastructure capacity and broadband speeds that are there now. And so what you see in this next visualization, uh, again, compiled with our national broadband and availability map, which by the way, Arizona is now uh, a member, uh, you see residents with device that have fewer devices. So in this, this is a high concentration percent of households uh, that have no computer, smartphone, or tablet. Um, so you, again, you can see across the country, you know, there are some really heavy, heavy designated areas. Some in Arizona, up in the uh, northeast quadrant and east, um, you know, that households just don't have devices. Uh, so you think about, you know, what we just went through and what we're coming out of with COVID, um, you know, where that leaves those that don't have access, where that leaves them as we begin uh, to continue to move forward and what, what has been lost over uh, the, the past uh, 12 to, to 15 months. Next slide, please. Scott, before we move on, um, we got a question from Bob Jacobson. Is there an, an advantage to building an actual schemes for industry job creation programs, et cetera, with applications for broadband per se directly or via support agencies like EDA and USDA? 
Uh, that's a lot. So I would assume, yes, there is a benefit to it. They all work hand in hand. Um, you know, again, when you're talking about strategy development, uh, workforce development, uh, digital inclusion, access and equity, uh, we recommend that these are tangential approaches that in addition to pursuing, uh, you know, infrastructure expansion, uh, you're also working economic development, you're also working uh, with digital access, inclusion and equity. Uh, you know, these aren't secondary issues or runoffs. Uh, there are comprehensive solutions uh, that can be done uh, together. Yeah. So yes, good question. Thank you very much. Next slide, please. Uh, so I'm going to talk <clears throat> briefly about our three new grant programs uh, established under the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021, otherwise known as the Access Broadband Act. Uh, we're going to, we're establishing and launching three new grant programs this year. Uh, we're also establishing uh, at NTIA the Office of Internet Connectivity and Growth, <clears throat> and it has several new obligations that directly impact uh, the efficiency and effectiveness of federal funds and how we target and use uh, resources across the federal government. Uh, number one, we're charged with tracking federal investment uh, across all of our federal partners. So the other ones that you will hear from, USDA, FCC, EDA, you know, we're all going to work together uh, to, to track the, the use and utilization and access to broadband infrastructure that's been constructed using federal support. Uh, and we're gonna coordinate that support um, to ensure the programs are not duplicative, um, that federal support is distributed in an efficient, technological neutral and financially sustainable manner. So again, we understand precious resources that is the taxpayer's money. Uh, and so we're doing everything we can to coordinate that and track that federal investment uh, and support. We're also streamlining a number of different applications to uh, federal funds. Uh, our office has the responsibility to create a central website through which applicants can learn about and apply for federal support through any of the federal broadband support programs. So in addition to our federal funding guide where we collect all of the uh, available federal information around uh, the funding of broadband programs, digital inclusion programs, uh, we now have the charge, if you will, to do a streamlined application and a streamlined accounting process where we have to develop mechanism, mechanisms, excuse me, to streamline program accounting how those funds are utilized, who are, who uh, are the entities uh, or communities that are applying for these funds, those sort of things that we have to do. And we'll uh, outline all this in an annual report <clears throat> that we have to publish describing our work, including the number of residents, unserved, underserved that receive broadband throughout all federal programs uh, and the FCC's universal service fund programs and estimate that economic impact. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what you see here is just the, pre the uh, prevalence of data, and utilization of data, uh, utilization of coordination between federal agencies. Uh, we're going to do a much better job uh, with being accountable to the American public of how these federal funds uh, are being spent. And equally as important, really showing the impact uh, both economically, um, socially, uh, of how uh, these funds and these projects are working to advance uh, American communities. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and so really we, we're launching, excuse me, uh, three new grant grant programs. So a billion dollar tribal broadband uh, connectivity program, excuse me, one second. <clears throat> First 90 degree day here is really dry. Um, and we're gonna expand uh, uh, access and, and digital inclusion and adoption on tribal lands to include remote learning, telework, telemedicine, telehealth uh, for those tribal areas and, and tribal communities that were impacted during the pandemic 19 uh, epidemic. Uh, we just released last week, uh, the broadband infrastructure program, uh, which is a $300 million program, but we will make up to $288 million available uh, for covered broadband projects. And that's defined as competitively and technologically neutral projects uh, for the deployment of fixed broadband service in a census block with at least one household or business does, that does not have access to 25.3. This program and the notice of funding opportunity is active. Uh, we're going to drop a link to the press release as well as a link to uh, the notice of funding opportunity uh, that's available right now. And then also I want to call your attention that we're doing a webinar, a national webinar on the broadband infrastructure program 
uh, next week, uh, June 9th, uh, with a replay broadcast on June 10th. So uh, we'll drop a link into that. You can sign up for that. Uh, but again, this is going for states, uh, again, to um, in, in partnership with uh, political subdivisions of states. So you can go to states, political subdivisions of the state, and a uh, private service provider. So again, public-private partnership uh, that we're pushing here. You can get much more information on this active grant program. Uh, again, we'll send links in the uh, chat for you to, uh, for your access. And then finally, we're also launching this year uh, a Connecting Minority Communities uh, pilot program that will make up to $268 million available uh, for uh, historically black colleges and universities tribal college and universities, uh, and minority serving institutions, of which Arizona has several, including TCUs. Um, Arizona has um, uh, tribal colleges and universities. They have uh, the AANH, that's uh, tribal um, serving, uh, or, sorry, Native American non-tribal serving institutions. They have Hispanic serving institutions uh, and Alaska uh, Native, Native Hawaiian designated institutions. So um, Arizona could be in a position potentially to uh, capitalize on this program uh, for several of the higher education institutions uh, that call Arizona home. So uh, we'll drop a link to that as well and you can find more information uh, on that as well. Um, so again, thank you, next slide. Uh, really quickly, you know, for the broadband infrastructure program that's alive right now, that's been launched, you see the link here, uh, we anticipate accepting applications through August 17, uh, 2021. Next slide, please. I'm going to try to speed up here so I can not make up my time. So really just at a very high level, we talked about the broadband infrastructure program defined as, you know, covered partnerships, and that is partnerships between a state or one or more political subdivisions of a state and a provider of fixed broadband service. Uh, so again, you know, fostering public-private partnerships with the service provider uh, industry uh, for these projects, right? Uh, there are a couple of funding priorities that I wanna highlight. We talked about what covered broadband projects mean, uh, but our funding priorities for this will be, and these are statutorily mandated. Uh, we want to provide uh, and fund projects that provide broadband service to the greatest number of households in an eligible service area, right? We wanna provide broadband uh, service to rural areas, right? We wanna fund those projects that are most cost effective in providing broadband service. Uh, and then there's a speed uh, uh, requirement as well, uh, or priority, that we're gonna fund those pro uh, projects that provide broadband with a download speed of at least 100 megabits per second and an upload speed of at least 20 megabits per second. So again, we're exceeding that uh, currently mandated broadband uh, standard. Uh, again, funding priority for this project. You can get all of this information on, uh, again, the NOFO, uh, and then specific information on our outreach and assistance on the upcoming webinars. And Ke uh, Karen has dropped some information in the chat, so thank you very much for that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we talked about eligibility. Uh, you know, again, you have to be a covered partnership. It's got to be a covered broadband project, and all that's defined in the NOFO. Uh, you have to designate your pr proposed service area, uh, and you can utilize other federal and state support uh, to leverage that. So we're, again, uh, but I want to note that each covered partnership may only submit one application for this grant program. Uh, but again, uh, we're very excited that we just launched this uh, and look forward to providing additional uh, uh, specific information on our upcoming information. Uh, thank you. Next slide. Uh, just really quickly, again, you go to grants.gov for the complete application packet. You've got to be uploaded to grants.gov uh, no later than 1159 Eastern on August 17th. Uh, we, we expect to complete our initial or review and selection of applicants and awards uh, by November 15th. Uh, and then we expect the earliest start date uh, under this NOFO to be towards the end of the year. So end of November, early December uh, for when these projects will start. Um, next slide, please. Really briefly, I wanna cover our tri a tribal broadband connectivity program. Uh, we expect to release the notice of funding opportunity for the tribal broadband program here very soon within the next several weeks. Uh, again, and we're targeting tribal governments tribal organizations, tribal colleges and universities, of uh, the Department of Hawaiian Homelands, 
<clears throat> on behalf of the Native Hawaiian community and Native cor corporations. So uh, again, the what, the purpose to expand broadband adoption and deployment on tribal land. So we're talking both infrastructure and digital inclusion access and equity, <clears throat> as well as to support, <clears throat> excuse me, distance learning, remote work, uh, telemedicine, telehealth projects, uh, specifically of these communities were impacted uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Again, we anticipate accepting the applications for the Tribal Broadband Program uh, this summer uh, and hope to release that notice of funding uh, opportunity uh, in a few weeks. And we will have uh, public facing webinars that talk specifically about the Tribal Broadband Program as well. Uh, so stay tuned to our website. Uh, and when we release that, you will have access to that information. Next slide, please. Uh, really briefly about the eligible entities, as I talked about before, <clears throat> you know, tribal governments, tribal colleges and universities, et cetera, uh, really native corporations as defined under section three of the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, that's specifically for uh, Alaska entities or Alaska native corporations. Uh, but again, we know just on a, a data review, there are several uh, tribal governments, tribal colleges and universities, tribal lands located uh, in Arizona, tribal organizations in Arizona um, that potentially could qualify. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'm just going to touch on this really briefly. Um, Section 905A13 defines what the, you know, the definition of tribal lands. We addressed this in the NOFO. We'll address the eligibility requirements uh, in, in the webinars associated with the tribal broadband program. Uh, but again, if you want specific uh, eligibility standards of uh, tribal land, uh, we have that located here. Uh, next slide, please. So key requirements of the act, and, and don't laugh when, when we go through these, uh, 180 days from award for grantees to commit funds. So that's what we're targeting, 180 days uh, from the, we make the award uh, and then for the grantee to commit those funds to start those projects. So we're looking to, seeking to fund uh, projects and activities that can start right away. Again, a lot of these tribal communities, a lot of our tribal uh, brothers and sisters are hurting we're trying to get access to trying to launch programming uh, as soon as we possibly can. A uh, one year completion deadline for all of the digital inclusion, telehealth, education, and telework projects. Um, a really robust one year completion deadline for infrastructure projects, but we are building in an extension into the program that can be requested. Uh, <clears throat> only 2% uh, of the funds allowed by the act will be for an eligible entity's administrative expenses. So again, the gear, <clears throat> the focus of these programs are the projects themselves, uh, not to pay for you know, administrative expenses, consultants, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a cap on the administration expenses and fees for, uh, for the application and the projects themselves. Um, eligible entities that receive awards for new construction, for broadband infrastructure, must prioritize those projects that deploy infrastructure to unserved households. So that is going to be a key priority uh, for the uh, infrastructure portion of the tribal portfolio. Next slide, please. Really important, <clears throat> a lot for our tribal organizations, our tribal communities uh, under this program, no match, no federal match will be required. So this will be, you know, essentially 100% government funded uh, program, infrastructure, digital inclusion, access, and equity. No federal match required. So that's a really good uh, clarification we wanted to make you aware of. Next slide, please. Uh, and again, we talked about the timelines. Uh, again, extensions will not be available for the digital inclusion or broadband use and adoption projects because uh, we anticipate that those should be able to be uh, rolled out fairly quickly. Um, but again, if there's uh, you know, any delays, any anticipated delays, uh, we're building in uh, uh, an extension process by which uh, these uh, uh, entities can, can seek uh, an extension from the program and grants office. So uh, the extension process is here uh, and you can get more information. If you have any questions about that, you know, please feel free to join the webinars or uh, you can also send me an email offline uh, but we're going to do targeted outreach for all of our broadband grant programs so that we can address all of your uh, questions and concerns. Uh, next slide, please. 
Finally, I wanna talk about the CMC program, the Connecting Minority Communities. It is a pilot program, so it's gonna be non-competitive, uh, but we are really going to really focus on uh, building capacity, uh, building uh, uh, digital uh, inclusion and adoption at our HBCUs, TCUs, and MSIs. Uh, grants funds will be awarded to those institutions and consortia. So consortia, consortia includes HBCUs, TCUs, MSIs in partnership with a minority business enterprise or a tax exempt 501c3 organization, right? To do what? To purchase broadband internet access service, any eligible equipment, or to hire and train information technology personnel, right? If you are a higher education institution, you can do this to facilitate educational instruction and learning, including remote instruction and distance learning. Uh, or if you are MBE or tax exempt 501c3, uh, you can use these funds to operate the minority business enterprise or to operate the not-for-profit. It's not a not-for-profit, it's a tax exempt uh, 501c3 organization. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> again, we providing you this slide. Uh, this is just, again, an uh, overview of the what. Uh, even though we're allocated $285 million, uh, we're going to make up to $268 million available uh, for that pro for this project. Uh, press release should be coming soon. Uh, we're going public with the final rule in the Federal Register, and then hopefully within the next month or so, we can release the notice of funding opportunity. Uh, but our goal is to launch this program uh, in, uh, later this summer, um, and we'll be ready to rock and roll then. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is just a, a, another way of showing, I just wanted to highlight, particularly for Arizona, uh, under minority serving institutions, um, there's uh, Native Hawaiian, Hispanic serving, uh, Asian American and Native American Pacific Islander serving institutions, uh, a Native American non-serving, non-tribal institution. So Native American serving, excuse me, non-tribal institutions. So just on my preliminary review and preparing for um, these type of entities that are in Arizona, uh, Arizona has tribal college and uni universities. Uh, surprisingly, you have Native Hawaiian, uh, Alaska Native institutions that are designated by the Department of Education, uh, Hispanic serving institutions, uh, and APZs, and uh, Native American serving non-tribal institutions. So <clears throat> as I said before, you could potentially have several uh, entities that could be available uh, uh, for this, this program. Next slide, please. A couple of things <clears throat> I wanna highlight, the program requirements, and these were dictated by the act. Uh, at least 40% of the grant funds will be made uh, to HBCUs. At least 20% of all grant funds awarded uh, to eligible entities must be used to provide broadband access and or equipment and devices directly to students. <clears throat> eligible recipients that receive grants to provide broadband internet access service or eligible equipment to students must prioritize students are in need uh, per the need criteria factor, which will be outlined in both the final rule and the NOFO. Uh, and then if an uh, institution was going to purchase or lease equipment, the eligible entities must prioritize uh, the lending or providing of that equipment to students or patrons in the community who uh, don't have access to such equipment. And again, we'll lay out the program rules of how uh, we'll verify all of that. And then we're building in program evaluation uh, and data collection requirements in this program uh, that will be covered expenses by uh, the grant program. So again, so not only can we make the investment, we wanna make sure that we can track uh, the performance metrics uh, as it relates to um, you know, economic indicators, productivity, uh, and the like to really show a link between uh, you know this program, you know broadband infrastructure, digital inclusion access, utilization, uh, and, and and productivity, uh, whether it's economic development, workforce development, graduation rates, etc. So uh, we're going to do our best to to make that link. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, these are the eligibility standards. I, I won't bore you with that. Uh, we'll have a specific webinar where we talk about of the eligibility standards for CMC eligibility. Uh, it's not just the HBCU, TCU, or MSI. Uh, it also includes anchor communities as well. So we'll go through that at a later time. Next slide, please. So our next immediate steps, and I'm about to wrap up here. Uh, we're doing a call for merit reviewers. Uh, we're gonna publish the CMC final rule, which I expect to do uh, hopefully here in the next 
uh, week or so. Uh, we're actively calling for merit reviewers. We're gonna publish and finalize the notice of funding opportunity. Uh, we're conducting specific targeted stakeholder outreach and pre-application technical assistance. Uh, we're gonna open up the CMC application window. There's a merit review and programmatic review stage. And then finally that notification of acceptance uh, and project funding. Uh, next slide. Uh, so finally, again, for all of these programs, you know, we have upcoming webinars that are coming up for the broadband infrastructure program, June 9th and 10th, and another one planned for July 14th and 15th. You have your upcoming tribal broadband pro uh, program webinars and the CMC schedule here as well. So webinars start at 2.30. You have to register. Uh, please register. Uh, come to the event. Get all the information. Uh, and please, please, please uh, to participate, ask questions uh, as we launch these programs this year. Uh, next slide. So uh, this is just here. I'm going to wrap up right now. If you are interested in, in becoming a, an, in, uh, a merit review uh, member, uh, you can send an email to grantreviewer at ntia.gov. And this slide highlights what we are seeking in our merit review process. But I am over time, so I'm going to stop here and kick it back to the moderator. You can go to the next slide, and I will introduce our next speaker, which will be John Holman uh, from USDA. Uh, one of our partner uh, here, our partners here, federal agency partners, uh, that will give us an overview of our U.S. and their broadband program. So, uh, John, over to you. Well, Scott, thank you very much. Do appreciate it. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is John Holman. I'm the general field representative uh, for the Rural Utility Service. I cover the states of Oregon, Washington, Idaho. Most of you may be familiar with Brian Smith. He's been detailed to Washington, D.C., so I'm covering for him today. Uh, under the canvas of USDA, there's a lot of sub-agencies. Uh, I'm with uh, the Rural Utility Service, which kind of has two areas of focus. One is electric for transmission. The other is telecommunications. And I'll be discussing our telecommunication programs in a little bit of detail to give you some interest uh, of those programs. But before I do that, if you can go to the next slide, please, I'd like to turn it over to Tim O'Connell, who will give you some idea uh, on, for rural development, uh, which is another sub-agency. We work very closely together whose focus is economic development to give you some idea of all the programs that are available. Tim? Uh, yeah, thanks, John. Appreciate that. And uh, good morning and good afternoon, everybody. I uh, appreciate being on today. Uh, my name is Tim O'Connell. Like it was said, I'm with the Innovation Center as part of USDA. And I'm just going to quickly just cover some of the, um, the majority of the pro uh, large part of the programs we have that aren't uh, particular to broadband but can be used for broadband. Um, we're a funding agency. Um, people have said we're between the fifth to the 13th largest bank in the U.S. Um, we have primarily loans in our portfolio, but we also provide grants as well. Um, again, that's part of the um, what we do is try to do capital stacking, and that's the purpose of today's call is to find the best mix of uh, project funding for your projects, whether that's a combination of grant um, loans or um, and other equity types of um, funding. But within USDA, um, we have three major buckets. Our Rural Business Cooperative Service provides um, loans and grants for business um, development in our B&I Guarantee Program, Renewable Energy, um, and our cooperative programs. Um, in our other bucket, our Rural Housing Service uh, is primarily single-family housing mortgages, um, multifamily, um, as well as uh, our community facilities, which uh, funds at a, either a grant or a long-term low-interest loan, um, essential community facilities, such as um, hospitals, um, roads, uh, clinics, and things like that. And then the uh, portion of the um, USDA rural development that John works for is our rural utility service, like he mentioned, which covers broadband and telecommunications, but also uh, as in addition, water and infrastructure. So we're a pretty uh, diverse agency, uh, 50 plus programs. Um, we're not the easiest um, to navigate, but um, it's best to contact uh, someone that you know of. And within the Arizona, um, we have some really outstanding staff at the Arizona State Office. Uh, Jeff Hayes is uh, the current acting state director, and he's also your community programs director um, in his real day job. Uh, Gary Mack is uh, the head of the business department there at, in Arizona. 
And then Jenny uh, Gorzik is the housing person that you would need to contact. And then like John mentioned also, um, we're both covering for Brian Smith, who could be on there today, but he's your general field representative that would have information for um, the telecommunications programs that John will be covering. Um, and like uh, Arizona, we have other state offices, um, 47 in total throughout the country. And uh, the advantage of our, one of the major advantages of our agency is that we do have people in state offices as well, area offices. So we're very approachable. And um, in the work that I do, try to get people to talk about a project versus uh, trying to talk about a specific funding stream. And I think one of the questions earlier on kind of uh, mentioned that is how you should, um, should you define your project based on a program? And the best thing to do is ask you to figure out um, what your program is or what your project is and try to find the best source of funding for that. And that's what we're here for today to discuss. Um, some great opportunities through NTIA. You'll hear something from EBA and some others. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to you, John, and talk about our um, infrastructure um, broadband programs at USDA Rural Development. So thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Tim. Yes, there's so many different programs out there. Uh, our role is really to help you identify the program that fits your project uh, and help you navigate the application process because it can be kind of daunting with federal programs. If I could have you go to the next slide, please. Uh, just to give you some ideas, the level of funding through our telecommunication programs, we have a number of them here. Uh, we've provided over the past 10 years about $8 billion in funding. Uh, we had a broadband initiatives program for a period of time that had about $3 billion. Uh, and I'll talk about uh, a couple of these core programs, but just wanted to give you some idea as the amount of funds that uh, have been available uh, historically. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. We also have uh, uh, some tribal investments uh, that have uh, been awarded uh, on a national level, about 20 million out of the uh, fiscal year 2018 and 2019. Uh, so we do have uh, quite a focus on uh, our, our tribal investments, working with tribal organizations, projects on tribal lands, and just wanted to give you uh, just a kind of a snapshot here at the level of funding for tribal entities. Uh, next slide, please. So what we have with the RUS telecommunication programs is four core programs. The first one there is our infrastructure program. It's been around since the 1940s when we started to get telephone to the rural communities. Uh, the program rules uh, haven't changed that significantly over a number of years, but it is starting to fit for broadband projects. Uh, it's a real opportunity to get broadband out to our rural communities at the cost of money. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more in detail of our infrastructure loan program. Most of you have probably heard of our pilot program called ReConnect, now referred to as Rural E-Connectivity Program. Uh, we had gone through a couple different phases as a pilot, but now the regulation is being written uh, for public comment, and I'll, I'll get into the, the details of that uh, and eligibility requirements. Uh, we also have a couple of true grant programs. One is Community Connect Grant. The other is a distance learning and telemedicine grant. And I'll talk a little bit about those, but those are really true grant programs uh, if your project uh, is needing that. Next slide, please. Uh, so with our infrastructure loan program, there are some benefits to it. Uh, I mentioned that it is at the cost of money. We have the ability to work with the Federal Financing Bank and the Rural Telephone Bank to get extremely low rates uh, based upon the time that that money is needed or advanced, uh, you can get interest rates uh, lower than 2%. You'll not find that in the private lending uh, uh, to get uh, those favorable rates as well as terms. Uh, we can have uh, the terms of the loan uh, for the economic life of the facility uh, plus an additional three years to stretch out that amortization uh, so that the loan pencils out for your project. We have the ability to defer payments for a couple of years so that you can get your project built out uh, to start generating some revenues before you have to uh, meet those expenses. Uh, the infrastructure loan program is really designed for uh, telephone companies and incumbent local exchange carriers. Uh, so the first thing that we would do with you is identify the ownership of the project to see if that might be the program uh, if you are interested in a loan. Uh, and the funding is available for the program. We get about 690 million every fiscal year. Don't even come close to spending it. 
There is no deadline for the program. You can apply anytime. And uh, it would be a quick turnaround time for us to be able to process a loan application. Next slide, please. So our ReConnect program or Rural E-Connectivity program uh, has been a pilot program. We rolled that out in phases uh, based upon a Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2018 and 2019. The first round was 600 million. The second phase, if you will, 550 million. Uh, and uh, we've been had some successes with the program. Uh, the real litmus test to reconnect is that the program is designed like most other programs to provide access, uh, sufficient access uh, to areas that don't currently have it. That is defined as uh, a service of no greater than 10 megabits downstream, one megabit upstream. Uh, and that is terrestrial based broadband for residential only. Uh, so that's something that we kind of have uh, the applicant uh, 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 put into their proposal to identify multiple areas or maybe perhaps one proposed funded service area that meets that requirement. Uh, we have another anticipated funding round coming up in, uh, sometime in August. Uh, we anticipate a good level of funding. Uh, and because the uh, program has been written into regulation, we might see some changes to that elig eligibility requirement. It could possibly go to 25.3 or even 100 symmetrical service. So as you're walking out your project and identifying some project areas that could fit for our ReConnect program, you'll want to know that those could be some changes. So you'll want to get your GIS experts or your mapping experts, if you will, to identify some areas that could meet a threshold uh, requirement of 25.3 or still remain at the 10-1. 25-3 is our build-out requirement. With the ReConnect program, uh, historically, we've seen a lot of fiber, uh, but we do uh, uh, allow a mix of technologies or even one technology being proposed. Uh, we see a lot of fixed wireless uh, applications a a along with some fiber. So it, depending upon your project, uh, we do allow um, any type of technology to be proposed with the program, uh, but it is written into regulation. And uh, if you are to sign up for federal alerts, uh, you'll get notified of that announcement. But it's always good for us to be in conversation early to see if we can uh, kind of identify those areas uh, that don't have sufficient access. Next slide, please. So who can apply for the ReConnect program or rural e-connectivity? Uh, that is pretty broad in scope. Uh, what we're looking for is the applicant to own, operate, and maintain that broadband network. Now, the ownership structure could be very unique uh, depending on the project, uh, what agreements or partnerships are in place to provide service. Uh, we just want to make sure that uh, those that are receiving grant money or loan dollars are not one removed from the actual project. So we're kind of looking for a complete solution. Uh, the only applicants that are ineligible are individuals and limited partnerships. So everyone else is eligible. Uh, we're starting to see a lot of utilities uh, take a look at this program to get broadband built out. Uh, there's some opportunities there for right of way access and things like that. Uh, even municipalities, cities, states, nonprofits, uh, all eligible as long as we can uh, have them own and operate the broadband network and provide connectivity to our communities. The loan is up to 50 million. Uh, if you are to request a grant only, that's 25 million. Uh, if it's a grant only ask, uh, that's a 25% match requirement. So keep that in mind. We're looking for a firm commitment. Uh, you can do a combination, which will be split 50-50 uh, between uh, the total project costs. If it's a 50 million, uh, of course, 25 million for the grant, 25 million for the loan. Next slide, please. So the Community Connect grant program, it's a true grant uh, program. It's really for smaller projects of 3 million or less. Uh, the uh, program has some similarities to reconnect and that uh, we're uh, still serving underserved communities. We have an eligibility requirement that the area that you identify proposed funding for uh, a project has no greater than 10-1 uh, fixed broadband. Uh, one thing that has changed with this program is that wireless and satellite is no longer being considered uh, as part of that eligibility. 
It's only publicly available fixed broadband. Uh, so no LTE wireless or the satellite. Uh, the uh, real distinction between the ReConnect uh, and the Community Connect is that ReConnect could be multiple areas. Uh, Community Connect can be only one contiguous area. And of course, uh, you can only go up to 3 million. But a real opportunity, if that if you were looking to phase out a potential project, perhaps you could look at both programs. You could look at ReConnect for a build in uh, multiple areas and then kind of identify a smaller project of 3 million or less. Uh, and of course, both programs are, are to serve our rural communities. Uh, we've had a good level of funding for the program, about 35 million every fiscal year. Uh, but uh, last uh, funding rounds, we've combined it for 65 million. We're currently in review of this current fiscal year applications. So your uh, future project, we would have to look to fiscal year 22, which will open up probably later this calendar year. Next slide, please. So distance learning and telemedicine grant, it's a true grant program. Uh, it is a telecommunication type program uh, for those purposes. Uh, we've uh, had a really good level of funding for this last fiscal year 20 uh, in window one of 71 million. Uh, so we aggressively outreached the program, uh, but then something happened. We had COVID-19 and the interest in the program grew significantly. Uh, so in round two, we only had 25 million, but we received 534 applications on a national level. So it's been uh, completely oversubscribed for the dollars we have. Uh, this current fiscal year funding round is closing this Thursday, June 4th. So any project that you're considering for this program, we would have to look to the next fiscal year. Uh, and we'd like to hear from you about what you have identified for the program. Uh, next slide, please. So the program really is for distance learning telemedicine as a real-time interactive delivery uh, between user sites. It's telecommunication program. Uh, it would cover the cost of equipment, uh, perhaps some software or instructional programming, uh, the inside wiring to hook up all the equipment. Uh, we would uh, we could be working with schools. Uh, school districts, uh, healthcare centers, uh, doesn't have to be that, uh, but if you're needing equipment up to a million dollars per project for a grant, uh, that's the program with a 15% match requirement. Uh, but it has to meet this definition of either distance learning or telemedicine. It could be a mix of both, uh, but we need you to identify what the predominant uh, use of the, uh, your project is, uh, one or the other. Uh, to connect teachers and students or to connect me medical professionals uh, so that folks in our rural communities can eliminate the uh, travel time to access such services. Uh, we have the ability to fund what we refer to as non-fixed components, uh, uh, equipment that doesn't have a physical site location. An example of that would be a mobile health clinic or perhaps maybe uh, some education uh, that doesn't have a, a physical site. But that is our distance learning telemedicine grant, which is a true grant program. Uh, it's kind of unique. Uh, and we'd like to hear from you about your project for that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so here are the numbers for Arizona. Uh, we've had some success in our infrastructure loan program, only 12 million. Uh, Reconnect, uh, we've got about 2 million in, in uh, awards uh, thus far with that program. Uh, we hope that those numbers will increase over this next funding round. As I mentioned, ReConnect or Rural E-Connectivity, we anticipate about a billion dollars, if not more. Our distance learning and telemedicine grant program, pretty good over the past 10 years, about 5.4 million. So that's really good uh, considering uh, the, the program historically has only had about a maximum grant ask of 500,000. It's been increased to 1 million. Uh, so a lot of dollars in that program in the state of Arizona. We have not funded a Community Connect grant in Arizona in 10 years. Uh, and that's kind of the same case that we're experiencing here in Oregon and Washington. Uh, some of the changes to the program are really opening it up. Uh, we're gonna start to see some successes with Community Connect for smaller projects of 3 million or less. Uh, we had a broadband initiatives program for a while, some success there in Arizona for 35 million. Uh, but a total uh, about 55 million. Next slide, please. So here's our contact information. Uh, as Tim had mentioned, 
Uh, it's always good to be in conversations uh, to identify uh, the right program as there will be a lot of time and effort on your end administratively to craft a good proposal and we're here to help. Brian Smith is your field rep. Uh, he's really good. He's been uh, doing this stuff for a long time and here's his contact information. He's number one on his email. I'm number two, but we work as a team. Uh, you can send Tim or me or Brian a message and we'll respond to you. And uh, with that, I will send it over to uh, Shamay or Karen. I think we're gonna get into a stretch break. Thank you, everybody. Well, whoever wants to come on screen, I think I welcome you all to take a stretch break. We'll take about five minutes and meet you back here. Um, if you wanna add uh, any questions into the chat, we will do your best to answer them. So um, let's take about five minutes and I'll meet you back here uh, for a presentation, uh, for our next presentation. I figured that Shanae could pull together the slides, comma, but she didn't do it. Her mic is open.
Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can. Great. Um, I'd like to go ahead and uh, get started with our panelists. I apologize. I thought we were still stretch breaking. Um, and uh, introduce uh, Cindy Patak. Uh, Cindy's from the Economic Development Administration. She's somebody that you work very closely with, not just with myself, but uh, with the Arizona Commerce Authority in general uh, around our economic development uh, projects here in the state, uh, particularly in the rural areas. So Cindy, let me go ahead and pass this over to you. Thank you, thank you, Jeff. Um, Shamay, if you wanna move it on to the next slide. My presentation is gonna be a little bit more brief than my predecessors. I, uh, we are not the biggest kid on the block by any stretch of the imagination, but what I'd like to do today is just give you a very brief overview of who we are um, and what we do and, and where we kind of fit into the broadband connectivity space. Um, we're a very small um, agency by most people's standards and we were really only created in 1965, but we are the only federal agency that is exclusively focused on economic development. And I, and I wanna uh, focus on that because that is the lens in which we view the world. So whether it's broadband or any other type of infrastructure project, we are always going to be looking at it from the perspective of private investment and job creation. Um, and, and as has been stated many times by you know, uh, the presenters here, we all work together and we're all, you know, we're all working toward the greater good. It's really our missions that really differ. So how, how this is all packaged, I think it is really it's really important to know what the mission of the funder is. And more importantly, not to, not to try to fit your project into uh, our, our goals and priorities, but really kind of uh, make sure that you work with all of us to, uh, to find the right fit. And we're obviously here all working together to make sure that that can happen. EDA's primary emphasis is really about regional economic development efforts, and it is locally driven, locally based uh, decisions. And our emphasis is in working with distressed communities. We focus our efforts on strategic investments that again, focus on job creation, attract yeah. private investment and develop economic capacity building. Uh, and, and just a little bit about how we operate, say pre-pandemic and, and where we are now. EDA has six regional offices and I actually technically work out of the Seattle regional office. Uh, since the pandemic though, we've grown, we've grown very quickly, probably doubled in size. And we now have an economic development representative in, in every state. And so primarily what before the pandemic, when we worked out of an office building in Seattle, we're, we're now kind of spread over all over the country. And what that really means is that I'm here to focus exclusively on your needs here and I can offer as much technical assistance as, as you need me to. Next slide. And, and so what we, how we primarily uh, accomplish our mission is through a series of funding programs and they're, they're grant-based and we focus on a variety of economic needs. Um, partnership planning, local technical assistance, we have a revolving loan fund. And since our inception, we've kind of focused primarily on our public works program. What's, what we've added in the last couple of years is our economic adjustment assistance portfolio. I, I think we all know it as the CARES Act. And we're, we're kind of in this in-between space now. We're transitioning from CARES Act funding over to the American Rescue Plan Act funding. So unlike my uh, colleagues here, we don't really have a NOFO on the street yet, but that's something that we're gearing up toward. So as we kind of focus on what your needs are with regard to broadband connectivity, I think the best thing that we can do is have those one-on-one -on -one conversations and try to kind of talk through what you're trying to do and kind of get yourself positioned so that when a NOFO comes out, you know, you're in the best, you're in the best possible place to uh, put an application together. We have a lot of regional and national programs. I'm not going to go into all of those today, but I have some links up on the screen so that you can click on those, what, what our what our funding opportunities are and some of our other programs. And the complete packages, as well as the applications and your ability to view those application packages can also be found on grants.gov. Next slide. So 
So I, I talked a little bit about uh, decision making being locally based. The way uh, the Economic Development Ad, uh, Administration operates in the field is through our Economic Development Districts. And I'm sure that mo most of you work with them fairly closely. Arizona is one of those states that doesn't really have an Economic Development District in every area of the, of the state. There are four. And um, the, 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 the area between Metro Phoenix and Tucson is not necessarily covered by an EDD, but most of rural Arizona actually is. <clears throat> and so when we talk about a comprehensive economic development strategy, that is a document that is put together with significant community stakeholder input um, by that economic development district. And in absence of that, we also look at equivalent planning documents that, that is accepted at the EDA at our discretion. So that when we look at broadband, for example, even uh, if, if your SEDS doesn't really go into a lot of detail on what a broadband strategy looks like, you might tap into other documents. And I know Jeff and the Arizona Commerce Authority are really working more toward a comprehensive statewide plan. So there are any number of ways we can approach this. <clears throat> So just to talk a little bit about who is eligible to apply for EDA funds, uh, federally recognized Indian tribes and political subdivisions of this state, whether it's the state itself, counties, cities, uh, municipalities, special purpose unit, units of the state or local governments that are engaged in economic or infrastructure development activities. And um, there are a lot of entities with uh, those municipalities that have applied institutions of higher education and also nonprofit organizations that are acting in cooperation with an official of a political subdivision of the state. So I wanna just uh, emphasize that a little bit so that while nonprofits are definitely eligible, they're generally out there uh, working on behalf of, of a municipality or some component of government to, uh, to deliver the work that's um, of interest to that government. The one caveat here, and, and it's an important one, particularly since we're talking about broadband, uh, is that individuals and, and for-profit entities are not eligible for EDA funds. Next slide. So what are we doing in, you know, working in broadband and, and, and really how does the, how, how has the pandemic really shifted our thinking and EDA's thinking with regard to broadband? And again, I said, you know, we fund a variety of projects, all uh, exclusively focused on economic development, um, but the importance of broadband has really floated to the top. It's something that we've always funded, um, but it, it, it didn't take long to understand the impact that the pandemic had on on the entire state because there's an absence of broadband connectivity. So now that we're kind of a year and a half into this, what, what we recognized is that, and I think for many things, a pandemic didn't really cause anything, um, but I mean, in the economic development space, but re what it really did was amplify the significance of what had been happening in many cases over, over a period of years. Um, the lack of connectivity in rural Arizona uh, is really shown itself when, when the entire global system shuts down and we can no longer do business in any other arena except through uh, uh, broadband connectivity. So we're shifting and we're, we're taking a closer look at that. So under the CARES Act, funding supported broadband projects, uh, the applicant had to clearly explain how the proposed project either prevented, prepared for, or responded to the coronavirus and or that it responded to economic injury as a result of the coronavirus. And that's, that was a tough nexus to make because, you know, as we said, at the end of the day, did, did the pandemic cause this? And, and, and sometimes that was a tough case to make. Uh, so Shumei, if you could take, uh, uh, move to the next slide. You know, and we're all evolving and learning. Um, EDA has a series of investment priorities. And just recently, maybe a month or so ago, we updated those, uh, those priorities. And rather than focusing uh, almost exclusively on the pandemic under the CARES Act, uh, so, and, and there are seven now, but I'd like to highlight these two. Uh, our new investment priority is one of equity, which I think we've all been talking about here today, and recovery and resilience. Uh, and if you kind of take a look at recovery and, and resilience, what I think is interesting to note is you don't see the word COVID appear anywhere. But it's clear that, that we can speak to COVID, but we're also looking at some of those other things that we now know 
uh, we're, you know, again, we're always there, structurally always there, that the pandemic actually highlighted, so that we're able to really uh, make the, that nexus now. So economic development planning or implementation projects that build economic resilience to and long-term recovery from economic shocks, like those experienced, and obviously COVID, but like those experienced by coal and power plant communities or other communities impacted by the decline of an important industry or a natural disaster that may benefit from economic diversification focused resilience. And I think that that's a lot of what we've seen, particularly in rural Arizona, that a lot of this other subtext was really going on. And then once the pandemic hit, it just has literally shut everything down. So I think in terms of putting together a broadband plan or broadband application for the EDA, um, it's 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 going to be a lot easier case to make, and of course I'm here to to pro provide that technical assistance once the NOFO comes out. I've got the link below that you know can go into the the uh, all of the seven uh, investment priorities. The the other five I think everyone's going to recognize they they're pretty much unchanged, but I feel that these two are important to highlight because again that's that's kind of why we're all here today to discuss these two things. Next slide. And so I think it would be remiss to say, particularly now that you know we're all here together, you know, with with my colleagues, that EDA collaboration with other federal agencies can leverage resources that support broadband projects and efforts. And I and I would say, in in, in with the the magnitude of the folks that we have here in this workshop today, um, it's a it's a lofty statement to make because I feel that we're really much more complementary to say someone like NTIA and we're not necessarily carrying the ball here or carrying the water. But what we're very good at is economic development integration. Uh, and I, I just want to give a shout out to my colleague Francis Sakaguchi, who I believe is listening in. Uh, but she's actually the one that I've worked with that introduced me to actually all of the folks on this workshop today, such that we have the ability, understanding that we are not the end all be all uh, in folks trying to put together broadband infrastructure, we've got a lot of uh, colleagues and other federal agencies that are so willing, and also the Arizona Commerce Authority, um, so willing to collaborate and, and work together to kind of find out what is the root of the issue? Um, how can we all work together to, pri to, to provide not only the financial resources, but the appropriate technical assistance so that whether you put a grant application with us at the EDA or whether it's to NTIA or whether it's to USDA, you, we, we're all working together uh, so, that in, in, so that we can have information exchanges and collaborations um, so that it, it's actually, I'm not gonna necessarily use the word easy, but when it really comes time for you to put together a portfolio of, of sorts in which you're making that determination. And I know Bob asked that question earlier. What's the best way for us to approach this? You'll have, you'll, you'll, you'll really be able to do that because you've strategized with all of us together. So we all understand what we're talking about. And if, if we don't know each other, we certainly know of each other. And that's that's what we'll bring to you in terms of our overall assistance, particularly moving forward uh, under the American Rescue Plan. Next slide. So again, I, you know, I, I, I really only came here to speak for a few moments and, and I touched very lightly on what our program has to offer. And obviously in absence of, of a NOFO, there isn't much more to say at this point, but I do want to say, again, I, I'm really thankful to be part of this group that's on this workshop today and make myself available to anyone that's listening in um, as we move forward under the next NOFO, uh, under the American Rescue Plan, and also my colleague Francis together, and like I said, with this team that we have in this workshop, um, it really is our goal to make sure, to the extent we're able, that all of Arizona is connected to broadband um, in the near future so that all of our economic development goals are met and we can really move forward together sustainably and with a bright future. So with that, I'll hand it back to Jeff or to the next speaker. Um, unless there are any questions in the chat. I, I can't multitask when I'm presenting. Um, hey, Cindy, this is Jeff. Actually, there was a question in the chat and I, you know, I think that's something that we should expand upon. Um, one thing that I, is a little bit of a, a kind of a black hole for folks is the SEDS process. Yes. Um, you know, what, what's acceptable as a SEDS and what does that look like? Um, because a lot of communities want to have something like that or have that actual document done. Maybe you could explain so they can uh, get that done to help for, with more than broadband. 
Yeah, absolutely. So a SEDS is very specific to our economic development districts. And a SEDS is an acronym, as is we, we speak in those terms, Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy. Those are done by our economic development districts. And I, I believe that Stephen Peterson is on the line. I don't want to put him on the spot. Um, but he's he's been working diligently, not only on a SEDS, but on a broadband strategy for the region. Um, but that said, as I mentioned, um, all of Arizona is not covered by a SEDS. So as part of our review process, and again, the EDA is not kind of walking in and telling communities what we'd like to see, what we would really like to see in the, in this space, in the economic development space, we want to see you be able to implement what works for you in your community. And so whether you are guided by a comprehensive economic development strategy or you are guided by some other overarching planning document that serves your community appropriately, um, we're looking to make sure that your project is kind of strategically linked to one of those documents. So a SEDS, for example, might not go into, and, and they're all different, right? We don't really have a template. And as with any plan, you know, you can write a good plan in a couple of pages, but it's a very overarching document and is not necessarily prescri prescriptive. Another plan could be extremely detailed and could actually list out priority projects. And that's those are the projects that the Economic Development District would either uh, support or even maybe try to galvanize and put something together. But it doesn't need to be any one particular approach. But again, what we want to see is that there's some overarching document or strategy that you for which you are trying to deliver a project. And so again, that could be a, a a comprehensive economic development plan for a county or for a region of its own. Um, or, you know, Jeff, like your plan, your Arizona, you know, your statewide plan, um, without really knowing how much detail you're going to really drive into, it's a, it's a really nice umbrella. It deals exclusive, exclusively with broadband. It, it also provides the data that folks need to do good planning on their own, so that as they kind of get into the weeds of what the needs are for their own community, they are. They have the. They have the ability to make informed decisions, and that's what we really need to see when we're looking at a, gr a grant application. That the applicant has is making a series of informed decisions that are backed up and substanti substantiated by data, and and good planning. Um, and so those are the things we look for. Um, I know I see I see Stephen has uh, is uh, putting something in the chat. I, I really love what SIGO is doing both in their SEDS document overall, but also the level of detail and the partnerships that they're building with their broadband strategy. So that's a great model. But again, it is not exclusive to SIGO. Their approach is, isn't the only way. Um, and of course, when we say equivalent document, the best case scenario would be if you'd reach out to me when you're working with something and say, hey, this is the, this is the project that we're putting together and this is our overarching strategy and this is how we got there. And hopefully there's some document that's linked to that. And I could, I'd be happy to kind of take a look at that to see if that's something that we could work with. And nine times out of 10, if, if, if your approach is a strategic one, whatever you're working with is, is, uh, is gonna be good for us. And we're, and we're gonna wanna make it work for sure. Awesome, thank you, Cindy. You've been a great partner and you're a welcome addition to our state. Um, and, and for those of you who have not had a chance to talk to Cindy and, and uh, her organization, I highly suggest you do. Um, they've done some really great work here in Arizona and, and hopefully will continue to do so. Um, next up, we've got Ryan Palmer uh, from the FCC. Um, and Ryan is gonna talk a little bit about some of the programs they have. Uh, as you guys if you, who follow the press and follow the industry, there has been a lot happening with the FCC uh, in the last, gosh, six to nine months. Uh, different programs, different strategies, different leadership. I uh, had a chance to uh, be on a call with their new acting uh, chairwoman, who's fantastic. She had some really interesting ideas about stuff. And uh, Ryan's going to go ahead and give you a quick update in terms of uh, what's available today and maybe give a little bit of a hint about what's coming here in the near future. Ryan, are you there? I'm here. Thank you, Jeff. And thanks to uh, Karen and Chamai and Jeff. Thanks to all of you for having me here today. It's a pleasure to join the group. Uh, my name is Ryan Palmer. I'm the chief of the telecommunications access policy division at the FCC. Um, we are also known as TAPD or TAPD. We love our acronyms at the FCC. Uh, next slide, please. And so today I wanna go over a number of things. I will 
probably speak fast. Please stop me at any time if there's questions. I'd rather have a conversation than just hear myself drone on. But um, I'm going to speak fast because there's a lot I want to cover. Uh, it might get a little weedy at times, but I'm wanting to provide information that I hope is useful to this group. Uh, and we'll, and you know, like I said, any questions at any time would be helpful. Uh, we're going to have a quick overview of our Universal Service Fund basics, and then we're going to discuss the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program, the Emergency Connectivity Fund, and our COVID-19 telehealth program, uh, both round one and round two, which are both active right now in, in different ways. Next slide. So um, an overview of how our Universal Service Fund uh, works. Uh, well, I should go back. So I said, I'm the chief of TAPD and our primary mission is to advance the goals of universal service that all Americans have access to robust, affordable broadband and voice services. And we do this pursuant to section 254 of the 96 Telecommunications Act. Uh, after that, the FCC officially established the Universal Service Fund to subsidize telecommunication services for low-income consumers, rural healthcare providers, schools, and libraries, uh, as well as consumers in high-cost areas. And if you look over to the right, that chart that's flowing down, the way we fund our programs traditionally are through contributions from telecommunications providers uh, that they pay via an assessment on their interstate end-user revenues. Those flow into our four Universal Service Fund programs, the high-cost program, which reduces the cost for providers of voice and broadband in high-cost areas, the Lifeline program, which reduces costs for low-income consumers, the E-rate or schools and libraries program, which reduces costs of broadband services for schools and libraries, as well as our rural health care program, which is the smallest of our four programs, which reduces costs for rural health care providers. And next slide, please. We can put a little, um, put that the numbers on the screen, hopefully help visualize what we do. This is for 2020, our authorized support. The high cost program, otherwise known or also known as the Connect America Fund, uh, we dispersed um, over $5 billion in 2020 for that program. The Lifeline program was uh, 854, around 854 million. For the rural health care program, it was just under 300 million. And for our E-rate or schools and libraries program, we authorized support of over $2 billion in 2020. Next slide, please. So first program I want to specifically dive into here today is the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program. It's one that we are uh, actively working on as with everything you'll hear about today. Right now, we're very uh, excited about the opportunity that Congress gave us. So um, give you a little history on just recently on May 12th, we officially launched the new $3.2 billion Emergency Broadband Benefit Program. Uh, which makes available to consumers substantial discounts on broadband service and connected devices. Um, eligible households will be able to receive on their broadband bill a discount of up to $50 per month or $75 on qualifying tribal lands. And eligible households are able to receive a one-time discount of up to $100 to purchase a, purchase a laptop, desktop computer, or tablet from participating providers if they contribute less than $10 uh, or more than $10 and less than $50 towards that purchase price. Um, right now, there are around a thousand broadband providers taking part in the program uh, and it's continuing, continuing to attract new providers. And on May 20th, just recently, we announced that uh, we had hit the 1 million household mark in the program or that 1 million households were already enrolled in the program. Um, and we continue to enroll qualified households every minute as we speak here right now. Uh, next slide. So. How do you become eligible for the program? Very important piece of the puzzle. Um, much of this is dictated from the statute that, uh, that created the program, but it also relies on our historical lifeline program uh, eligibility requirements. So um, initially, uh, if, if a household has an income at or below 135% of the federal poverty guidelines, um, they are that household is eligible for the program. And I should note, we are a household program, so there's one benefit per household, it's not a per person program. Um, but you can also be in the program if you qualify for our Lifeline program and any of the programs that are listed right there, all of those SNAP, Medicaid, et cetera, those are qualifying programs for our Lifeline program. So if you're in those programs, you are automatically eligible for Lifeline. And now the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program. 
Um, but there are also other programs through which you can come into this emergency program, including several tribal specific programs. Um, also, if you've experienced a substantial loss of income since February 29th, 2020, due to a job loss or furlough, and your total household income in 2020 was below 99, oh, slides change, was below 99,000 um, for single filers and 198,000 for joint filers, you can come into the program. And I should note that this eligibility requirement is two pronged, which is different than the others. Uh, you need to show substantial loss of income and that the income is below the threshold. You also, if you received a federal Pell Grant in the current award year, you're eligible for the program. And if you've received approval to participate in the free and reduced price school lunch program or the school breakfast program, including through USDA community eligibility provisions, uh, you are eligible for the program. And finally, you are eligible if you meet the uh, criteria for participating providers existing low income or COVID-19 program. So the providers that have opted in, the, the around 1,000 that we just referred to, if they had a pre-existing low income program or a, pre, or a COVID-19 program, um, you, can, you can enter our program through there. So you're eligible for our program if you participate in that program. Um, we have like I mentioned before, one monthly service discount and uh, connected device discount is allowed per household. And there are three ways to apply. Uh, one is through an online application available at getemergencybroadband.org. You see that at the bottom of this slide. Um, you uh, also, uh, applicants are eligible to submit mail-in applications, which they can obtain online or have by calling our administrator at the Universal Service Administrative Company. And they're also able to participate um, if, if they go in through a participating provider, um, if, they, if that provider has, has permission to register uh, applicants themselves, then they can enter directly through that provider. Uh, and I should note that if a consumer knows that they want to sign up with a specific participating provider, we are encouraging them to reach out directly to the provider first to see whether they should complete an online application at getemergencybroadband.org or just use the provider's process. We want it to be as, uh, as efficient and seamless as possible for eligible applicants. Uh, those who are currently enrolled in a Lifeline program do not need to complete an EBB application uh, to apply their benefit to their service. Lifeline subscribers should contact a participating provider and Lifeline subscribers can also apply their emergency broadband benefit and Lifeline benefit to the same offering. So if you're eligible for Lifeline and participate and you participate in this program, you're able to also, you're able to use both as long as the cost of the service uh, isn't less than the combined of those two benefits. Um, yeah, so, the, so I just want to point out once again, the getemergencybroadband.org is a great resource for consumers and for groups that may be helping low-income consumers navigate the application process. We have a lot of great resources there that we've intentionally tried to pull together to, to, to help those who are trying to help others participate in this great program. Uh, on that page, you can find consumer FAQs, information on how to prove, prove eligibility, uh, through additional documentation. And the, there's also what we call the Companies Near Me tool. So you can look at this tool and see which participating providers are near you and reach out if that's the way you would like to proceed. Finally, there's other resources or, and similar resources available at FCC.gov backslash, backslash broadband benefit. Next slide, please. I told you I was going to talk fast, but I hope, hope that helps. Um, so another new program to the FCC, I know what we're calling our, our appropriated programs, um, comes from the CARES Act. Um, we have the COVID-19 telehealth program round one, which I'll talk about now, and then we'll quickly shift over to round two, um, which is, which is uh, an even newer program. So uh, the CARES Act was passed by Congress and signed into law by the president on Friday, March 27th of 2020. It appropriated $200 million to provide healthcare providers funding for telecommunication services, information services, and devices to provide telehealth services in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, quickly thereafter, on Thursday, April 2nd, the commission adopted an order establishing the program and commissions, commission staff were expeditiously to implement the program. From April 13th to June 25th of 2020, the commission accepted applications uh, we were considered in the round one, we considered applications on a rolling basis, and we prioritized applications from areas that were hardest hit 
by the pandemic and where funding would have the most impact on addressing the healthcare needs. We quickly received many applications, eventually thousands of applications and demand greatly exceeded the $200 million appropriation. And by July 8th, just a few months later, all appropriated funds were exhausted. Um, and all told the commission awarded 539 applications from healthcare providers located in 47 states, the District of Columbia and Guam. Next slide, please. So I wanted to provide some specifics here. I won't get into all the details because no time is limited on healthcare providers in Arizona. So Arizona specifically received sending seven funding commitments in round one, totaling $2,161,083. I'm going to go through a few of the specifics here. For instance, an important one is the Navajo Nation Department of Health in Window Rock, Arizona. They were awarded $954,990 to provide home health care and remote monitoring services throughout the Navajo Nation to patients who are isolated and under shelter in place orders, including low income, elderly and vulnerable and high risk patients. I would say in round one, funding commitments were limited to a million dollars. So Navajo was right very close to that cap. Um, we also know that El Rio Santa Cruz Neighborhood Health Center in El Rio Health, in our, sorry, in Tucson, Arizona, uh, who has 12 sites throughout the community, they were awarded over $444,000 to provide video telehealth services and remote patient monitoring of chronic diseases to ensure continued care for high-risk patients during the pandemic. North Country Healthcare and Flagstaff was awarded a little over $418,000 for similar services. Um, next slide, please. And these are uh, in order, uh, not in order of importance, but in order of the size of the funding commitments that they received. So Lake Powell Medical Center uh, in Page, Arizona, they were awarded $221,267 for telemedicine carts, laptop computers, pharmacy computers, and telehealth platform licenses to conduct outside screening and testing for COVID-19 and to allow other patients to communicate with their healthcare providers from the safety of their home. So one of the things we were able to do with this program or we, we work to do is allow these healthcare providers to free up beds, not only for people who have COVID-19, but for those with other um, medical conditions, because I know every bed that they free up is another bed that's open for someone who really needs it uh, during the pandemic. And so uh, it's it's not just for COVID patients, it's for, for, for the community to try to better allow these healthcare providers to address COVID in their, in their communities as they know how best, you know, best how to do that. <clears throat> we also see, see here the Creek Valley Health Clinic in Colorado City, Arizona. They received $53,846 for tablets for both providers and patient use, remote monitoring and video conferencing equipment such as pulse oximetry and blood pressure equipment, scales and video monitoring equipment. And, and they were all used to help uh, improve the clinic's ability to offer virtual uh, telemedicine and to, to provide telemedicine kiosk for patient use and network upgrades. Next slide, please. And these last two, they're, they're smaller in funding amounts, but what we found is that these smaller healthcare providers, um, this amount of money really has made a difference in their communities. And so we have Serenity First Counseling in Green Valley, Arizona. <clears throat> they received $40,202. We also have the Jewish Family and Children's Services in Tucson. They were awarded over $27,000 to provide mental health telehealth services to individuals suffering from significant forms of mental health uh, disorders, including low income, older adults, and individuals with disabilities. And this is to prevent isolation, depression, and anxiety and other stress due to COVID 19. Um, and we had many, many. Uh, providers of mental health services uh, are, who are active in this program and who applied for this program. And uh, it's an important piece of, of what we've been doing. So that is, I hope that's a little bit helpful in the weeds of where some things that are impacting your communities in Arizona right now. And then we can go to the next slide. And that brings me to, to round two. So uh, based on our, the experiences of the COVID-19 telehealth program round one, and increasing importance, the increasing importance of telehealth during the pandemic. Uh, as part of the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021, Congress appropriated an additional $249.95 million <clears throat> to, uh, 
to, for the FCC's COVID-19 telehealth program. And that act was signed into law on December 27th of last year. Uh, pursuant to that law, we were required to move extremely fast once again. And in fact, the act, direct, the act directed the, the FCC to within 10 days of, of enactment to issue a public notice establishing a 10 day comment period where we would seek comment on the metrics used to evaluate applications for the second round of funding, as well as how to treat applications filed during the initial round of funding that were not selected. So that was all, uh, Congress had some specific instructions and things they wanted us to seek comment on before we set up round two of the program. Of course, we did that. And then following the comment period, we released a report in order that took steps to improve the program. It says stops here, sorry. We took steps to improve the program in accordance with congressional guidance while building upon the lessons from round one. And you can see a link right there to our round two information. There's a lot of great information on our, once again, on the FCC.gov website. I would note there's a, an update on round two. So round two of the program, uh, we had an application window that opened up uh, late April, April 29th and closed in early May. And so the, the applications have now been received and we're working with our administrator to review those applications so we can uh, proceed with making funding commitments as we did in the first round. And there's a number of steps that are different that we'll be following in round two, um, but, but at a high level, that, that's where we're at. And so more to come there uh, for Arizona, I'm sure. And finally, the next slide. Um, emergency connectivity fund. So this is the newest of our new appropriated programs. And it was uh, and just adopted recently on May 11th of 2021. We had a, unanimously adopted a report in order that implemented the $7.17 billion emergency connectivity fund program. Um, Congress appropriated these funds as part of the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, and the program will enable eligible schools and libraries to seek funding for purchases. This is a very important part of the program, purchases during the upcoming school year, and they can purchase laptops and tablet computers, Wi-Fi hotspots, uh, and other eligible equipment and broadband connectivity for students, school staff, and library patrons who would otherwise uh, not be able to access connected devices, not have access to connected devices and broadband service sufficient for remote learning. So this is 100% to attack the remote learning slash homework gap issue that we're all very well aware of. That's, that's out there right now. Um, if there's funding available after the provision of support for these upcoming purchases, <clears throat> then the program will reimburse schools and libraries for eligible equipment and broadband connectivity previously purchased during the pandemic that they, if they were purchasing those to uh, cover their unmet needs of students, school staff, and library patrons who would have otherwise lacked access during the pandemic. Next slide, please. An important question um, always is who is eligible? Uh, so for this program, our schools and libraries and consortia of schools and libraries that are eligible for our E-rate program are also eligible for the Emergency Connectivity Fund program. To be eligible for this program, an eligible school must meet the same statutory definition for elementary or secondary schools used in the E-rate program. Eligible libraries also include public libraries, tribal libraries, and some academic libraries, research libraries, and private libraries. And more, uh, more weedy information on that, the details are available in our order, also on our uh, website. <clears throat> So schools and libraries eligible for the fund do not need to be current. You don't have to be currently in the E-rate program. You can, um, but if you're not, then you and you haven't applied for E-rate support, you need to, you need to be prepared to demonstrate your eligibility as a school or library, uh, as we discussed in the previous bullet. Next slide, please. Thank you. So the first bullet, or the first bullet here describes the services and equipment that are eligible for the program, which we touched on earlier, such as. Uh, internet access service uh, and devices, laptops and desktops and other things. Uh, applicants may seek funding for up to $400 for each laptop and tablet computer and up to $250 for each Wi-Fi hotspot. So for all other types of eligible equipment and services, applications will be reviewed to assess the reasonableness of the cost based on similar requests and applicants' justifications. In construction of new or self-provision networks, 
and customer premise equipment for receiving data casting services are ineligible for support except where an applicant can demonstrate that there are no commercially available internet access service options sufficient to support remote learning for its students, school staff, or library patrons. Um, okay, and I am almost done here. Last slide. Um, just a little more detail about the first application filing window. We discussed how we're going to fund uh, for next school year. And then if there's money left over, we'll look back at the unmet need. And um, so an initial 45 day application window will be opened in June, which means it's coming up soon. Uh, this will allow our eligible schools and libraries to submit requests for funding for purchases made between once again, July 1st, 2021 and June 30th, 2022 for eligible equipment and services that are provided to students, school staff, and library patrons. Uh, schools and libraries seeking funding from the program must comply with all applic applicable local, state, and tribal procurement requirements for any equipment and services purchased and supported in the program. And once again, if there are remaining funds after the initial application filing window, additional, um, though another window will open to allow eligible schools and libraries to seek funding for that previously funded, uh, previously purchased services to meet the unmet need that they had. And I believe that is all I had here, um, but I hope that was useful and I haven't had a chance to look into questions, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, Brian, that was great. Um, thank you so much. Uh, you guys have invested a ton of money in Arizona and I can't stress enough how important it is when you were uh, listing the, the different health facilities. Uh, these are very rural areas that were hit hard by COVID, particularly on the Navajo Nation. So good, good stuff. Um, there is a question in the chat. I don't know if you want to just read it and answer it. But, yeah. Sure. Um, to, Jeff. So um, it says that, are you able to share any detail on rough timelines for when the COVID-19 team, so COVID-19 telehealth program round two uh, applications might be uh, begin to receive communications or notice on awards and denials. Um, we don't have a timeline to share now other than to say that we are working uh, as we did in round one to efficiently review the applications. Once again, there's a lot of interest uh, in this program. We just like we anticipated and like we saw in round one, um, we know Congress, they told us, made it very clear they want us to uh, this money to get to work to help impact the pandemic. So we have to get these funding commitments out there in order to make that happen. So we are working hard to do that. Right now, we do not have a, a timeline, but we uh, hope to have more information to provide as soon as possible. We will. We will have more information to provide as soon as possible. Ryan, has the response to the EBB program been what you expected, more or less? I know it's very early, but but what are you seeing so far? It is very early, but what I did expect and what we saw was a lot of interest, especially right out of the gate. Um, and that was, we were, we were anticipating that and we were glad to see it. We want this program to be successful. Um, and, you know, we're still every day we're, we're, we're looking at what's coming in and, and trying to, you know, manage our uh, expectations and things. We're still, we're still reviewing, uh, but we are, we have seen robust, interest in the program, both from the number of providers who are participating in the program and to the initial uh, and ongoing interest in from the applicants. But uh, we are continuing to look at that and look forward to the time where we can discuss some of those issues and, and, and see how it played out. Awesome. Th thank you very much. I really, truly appreciate your time. Uh, we covered a lot. Uh, for those of you who do not know, we do post everything to our uh, Arizona Commerce Authority website. So you'll have the ability to, uh, to go through the presentations as well as, as the, uh, the, the spoken uh, presentation. So oh, and Jeff, I'm sorry to interrupt. I see one more question here, which I can, should be able to answer. Does the EBB website have a meter indicating how much money is left? We don't have a meter, but we are required and our administrator USAC is required pursuant to the commissioner's order to, uh, to provide a forecast because one of the important things we want consumers and providers in the program to have an idea when we're winding down because it is, a, it is a lot of money, but it's a limited pool of money and we want to make sure everyone is fully in the loop and there's no surprises. So we will be, our administrator will be conducting that forecast and that information will be shared. And the exact format, I, I'm not sure, but I know it will be out there, whether it's a, a meter or some sort of uh, written 
uh, data that, that's disseminated. We're working on that, but, it, but we will be providing that information as we forecast the future of the program. Awesome. Uh, do we have any more questions? Okay, um, let me go ahead and, and again, thank you, Ryan, for, for, for taking the time. This is, this is great stuff um, and uh, something I'll review myself uh, just because of the sheer volume that you all are doing right now, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, if you guys look to the uh, presentation to the left, um, we've got a, a workshop schedule. Hopefully a lot of you have attended from the very beginning uh, as we move down the, uh, the different list. Uh, as you can tell, they, they build upon each other. Uh, we have our tribal um, workshop coming up next week, and that is invitation only for our Arizona tribes. Um, get an incredible speaker group for that. So if you are part of a tribal nation and uh, are interested, please, please do register. Uh, this is probably going to be our best one, I think, based on what I've seen so far. Um, and we, we've got our, our, our final wrap up on July 14th. Um, in the interim, we do have our working sessions um, uh, two weeks from now, um, if you're going to take a look at our technical assistance sessions, uh, we've got them broken up basically into two different time slots uh, based on the part of the state that you're in. Uh, if you cannot make your time slot, please feel free to, to hop on to the other one. Um, what's great about these is we have the opportunity to really dig deep into some of the issues. Um, a couple of the, the challenges that we've had are helping our communities clearly express what they want to do. One of the things we're gonna talk about uh, and you'll be receiving some information on is what we call an elevator pitch, the ability to clearly and concisely talk about what the issue is in your community. Um, so uh, we can spark that discussion with the various stakeholders as well as the, the various funding agencies. Uh, also, we're gonna take a look at these federal pro uh, programs just in aggregate and really try to drill down on some communities and what they qualify for. Um, one of the things I've learned in this process is are there very specific uh, programs out there. For example, the, the EDA, the Economic uh, Development Administration, has some money set aside specifically for communities that are transitioning from coal and coal plants. Uh, we have a lot of those in the eastern part of the state. So we want to really make sure that you're applying for the, for the programs that you have the best chance of, of finding that funding uh, and getting that done. Um, uh, also, if you've noticed in the chat, Shimei has put a, a survey. We try to get a, a handle on on how well the E2P content and the programs themselves are received so we can always improve. Uh, if you like it, great. If you don't like it, you know, please leave some feedback for that as well. Um, and uh, again, I'd like to, to thank everybody involved here. I believe that is our last slide. Oh, here we go. Um, we've got our Broadband USA funding search. Karen, did you want to speak to that or do you want me to go ahead and go with this? Uh, I'll let you know. In the event that all of the information about each of the grant programs came a little bit quickly for you and you want a reference, of course, one of the references is that you can go back and listen to this recording again. Um, you can also go to the Broadband USA funding search on our website and you can learn about um, these programs as well as other programs from the federal government that support broadband funding. This is a funding search that we update every year. Um, the new update is probably due in about a month uh, and Usually uh, that update includes, in, in this year it will be more funding, I'm happy to say, in many of these programs, plus some additional funding uh, programs and uh, a slightly new format. So while I recommend that you look at it now, come back in about a month for an even better and newer and more robust funding search, but it's still worth looking at it right now. It's a great resource to you. Um, because some of the programs are complementary. And um, I think although there's programs that, that are out there that are useful, your aspirations are growing. And so it's great to know all the programs that are out there that can support those aspirations. I also wanted to highlight that, um, particularly with regard to the programs that Scott mentioned, uh, the tribal funding, the Connecting Minority Communities and the Infrastructure Grant Program, um, Broadband USA, NTIA, does have a series of grant, per, uh, grant funding webinars that are available every month. Uh, and uh, the next one coming up in uh, July, in June is on June 9th and 10th. So please join us for those webinars if they are of use to you. Uh, and you can sign up on our website and you can learn more about them there. And all of our sponsors are really happy that you've joined us here. As uh, Jeff mentioned, 
Chimay has put a link in the chat for you to give us your feedback. We always appreciate your input so that we can make these webinars more effective and more useful to you. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, you've been a great partner through this whole process and, and, and provided a lot of leadership. And we're, we're, we're very excited to keep moving forward with our communities. Um, you know, as I meet with communities, it's amazing how much is learned and applied uh, in our state. So we're excited to do that. So um, let's see, there's, there's one last question here, Shemay. What do we got here? Um, registration link in the chat. I don't know what registration link they mean, unfortunately. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and move to wrap this up. So again, thank you, Karen, for your help. Scott, thank you so much. I, I know how busy you all are. This is a, this is a, a team effort here. And uh, I honestly believe that this is gonna help our state in the next couple of years move forward. So thank you everyone and have a great week and uh, uh, let's keep moving forward with this thing. Thank you, Ryan, thank you as well, Cindy. Bye. -bye.